to our service this morning here at Hamlin Road Presbyterian, whether you're joining us in person or live streaming or watching at a later date. Uh, it's so lovely to see the church really full and we've already had it full at the half nine service this morning, so it's amazing um, to see how many people are coming in through the doors of the church this morning. And we're so grateful as well to all of those that are facilitating the two services and serving at them. Uh, it takes a lot of preparation, obviously, for all of those involved, so we're so thankful to everybody that's doing that. Um, as we come to worship this morning, I've been thinking about Ephesians 3. Um, in Ephesians 3, Paul talks about uh, the mystery of the gospel, and the mystery of the gospel being that the gospel was meant for Gentiles like you and me. Um, and that's, it always makes my heart sing when I read that passage. And Paul talks about he being the least of the least um, who was sent to share the, the message with the, with the Gentiles. And then he reads, the, the, or he, he writes this passage. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all of the fullness of God. And I think as we gather this morning together, how lovely it is if we prayed that for each other, that we would be filled with the Spirit to know how wide and deep.
And so we're going to come before God now with our prayers. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, you are God alone. There's no other God, and there never has been and never will be. From eternity to eternity, you alone are God. All honour and glory belongs to you forever and ever. You, O oh Lord, are all love, all hope, all forgiveness, all truth, and all that we need. And by your Spirit, we ask you to strengthen us in our inner beings, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, and that we may know the love of Christ and be fulfilled with all the fullness of God. Father, forgive us when we get carried away by the busyness of each day, when we don't set aside time to spend it with you. Forgive us when we get caught up in our conflicts and resentments and frustrations, when we're quick to blame and slow to forgive. Forgive us when we base our desires on the things that the world shows us, on media and entertainment, food and drink, and when we neglect to focus on you and your desires. Help us, Lord, to turn our eyes to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. In his name we pray. Amen. And now Amy's going to come and share about Sunday school. Good morning, everyone. Do you know what? 9.30 sounded more awake than you guys. I'm not going to lie. Let's try again. Good morning, everyone. Oh, you're just bright as a button. I love it. And hello, everyone at home again. I've got to say, I'm slightly more nervous. See the freedom not having a live stream this morning? Oh, you want to heard the things I was saying. No, it was all lovely. Um, so I'm here this morning to chat to you guys a bit about Sunday school. So obviously we're doing Sunday specials right now and we're limiting it to P1 and P7 as well. But come September, we're kind of gearing up, hoping that things are more back to normal. But even if they aren't, we're hoping to get back into our Sunday school normal term. So not really doing Sunday specials anymore. But come September, come a lot of vacancies for leaders. And we were chatting as a children's committee being like, how, how could we get leaders in? How could we encourage people to come alongside us on a Sunday morning and help us? And we, we, we explored a few options. We thought we'd do the emotional blackmail option and be like, look how sad the children are. We have to limit the numbers because we don't have enough. But then we thought, no, because you'll burn out after about three weeks and you, know, you, you won't be in it for the long haul. And then we thought we could go spiritual blackmail and go, are you even saved if you're not helping? And then we thought, no, because for one thing, that's just not true. And um, yeah. We, we didn't think that would make God very happy with us as a children's committee. But we thought, why don't we ask our Sunday school leaders why they do it? <laughs> why they join the chaos of a Sunday morning with us? And maybe if you hear something that you identify with this morning in a little video we're about to show, if it just intrigues you to just want to find out a wee bit more, and even if you do that, like just want a little bit more information, please come and contact me. Just drop me an email. Even the leaders that you see in the video, contact one of them and just reach out to us. Even if you turn around and go, actually, that's really not for me. We're just so glad you came and found out a little bit more information because we would love to have you joining in any of our teams from beginners right up to seniors. We need help. So have a listen. And if any of this touches you or reaches out to you, or if you feel called to come and be with us on a Sunday morning, we would love to have you. So I'll leave you with the video now. The best thing about Sunday school well, there are a lot of really good things about Sunday school, but one of the things that I was most surprised about was the amount I learned myself uh, from the children and from preparing for Sunday school. It's an absolute privilege and pleasure for me to see the children develop from beginners through junior where I look after and up into senior and how we have continuity and we, we, make the, we, we teach children about Jesus and we teach children about God. I think the best thing about being a Sunday school leader is getting to explore the stories of the Bible, getting to introduce different 
Bible characters to the kids. And just seeing them learn um, about God, about Jesus, and watching them grow in their faith. Um, and I'm always amazed week to week how much they do remember and understand, even at four or five years old. Seeing how they apply and process that through their own wee minds and the questions they come up with. And it's just lovely to watch them grow in their faith and demonstrate little little things each week to just show how what you're teaching them each week and um, studying with them each week is helping them to grow in their faith in Jesus. And it's taken me out of my comfort zone a lot of times, but I really enjoy it. And apart from anything else, it's good fun. And uh, I like the I like the, the fun, the enjoyment of a, of a Sunday morning. I think the best thing is that we as a team get to invest into each individual child's faith um, and get to have fun at the same time. So I'd really echo any of that as well. If you're interested in being a Sunday school teacher, please do get in touch with Amy or any of the Sunday school leaders. Um, Gillian Noble is now going to uh, read our passage for us this morning. The Bible reading this morning is from Titus chapter 2, verses 1 to 15. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanders or addicted to too much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior, Savior attractive. For the grace of God appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us all from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These then are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Thank you, Gillian. And we're going to sing now before Christoph comes and opens that passage to us. The song we're going to sing is called Before You I Kneel. It's also known as a worker's prayer. Um, it's maybe one that we haven't sang before in church and maybe one that you're not very familiar with, but it is a beautiful song. It's so appropriate for our message this morning. So sing along if you can. Um, if not, I would encourage you to um, really reflect on the words and maybe offer them up as a prayer this morning. So let's stand together and sing.
Um, folks, it's wonderful to see you this morning. Welcome. I, I know that every week these days, it's possible that some people are coming back to church for the first time in a year or more. So it's just wonderful to have you with us. At the start of this second service, I'm reminded of a, a wee debate that we had in the, the staff team over the last couple of weeks when we decided we were going to do two services. Uh, we had to, had to think about which we were going to live stream. Um, so, you know, you talk about these things. So, so one person said, um, well, why don't we live stream the second one? Because we'll have done the service before and we'll be better at it. Um, those of us who are involved, we weren't so sure about that. Um, so I, I'm not going to be the judge of which of our, our two services this morning has, has turned out the better. I hope they're both opportunities for us to, to be together as the family of God in his presence. And taking a moment now to reflect on his word together. Let's pray as we do that. Lord, when Moses spoke to the people in Deuteronomy and when he, he referred to the, the message he was bringing them from you, he said, these are not idle words for you. They are your life. Uh, Lord, remind us that we, we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. Uh, Lord, help us to feed on your word today. Amen. We've been, for the last few weeks, in the book of Titus. We've been learning about a church that makes the gospel beautiful. And as Paul commissions his associate minister for the work in Crete, he wants to impress on Titus that God uses good churches to make the gospel of Jesus Christ attractive before a watching world. He talks a great deal about goodness in this letter. We saw that when we introduced the letter a few weeks ago. So, so far we've thought about a, a church needing good leaders. It needs good teaching. Uh, and then the last time we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, we, we began to, to notice some of that uh, that good teaching, it, it would lead to a, a, a people who are good in church. We thought about that a couple of weeks ago. And we saw in the early verses of Titus chapter 2 that the kind of community that God wants to create is an intergenerational discipling family, a place where people are, are cultivated into to Christian goodness. Whenever people encounter us, uh, this kind of a community, Paul says, they won't have a bad word to say about us. They won't have a bad word to say against the gospel. Wouldn't that be a lovely thing? Uh, I wish that were true of my life, uh, and I wish that were true of us here at Hamilton Road. Everything that we've said so far, particularly in those early verses of chapter 2, it makes sense for people who encounter us as a church family, so people who, who maybe come along to a church service or come along to some of our organizations, they'd get to see what this church family is like and, and, and may be drawn to Christ through that. But what about those who don't come to church? How are they going to encounter the goodness that God puts in his people by his spirit? Well, that's the next thing that Paul addresses in this letter. So he talks about the need for Christians to be good at work. We're going to use three questions this morning to uh, consider what it is to be good at work. The three questions, what does it look like? How is it possible? And what might we expect? So first of all, what does it look like, this being good at work that Paul has in mind? He, he mentions, I think, five different things but rather than using those five things as a five-point checklist, I'd rather, I'd rather point out quite quickly the, the first four of the things he mentions, 
and then treat the fifth one as a, as a sort of a summarizing idea. So first of all, the four things, verse four, Titus, teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them. I think there's something pretty obvious about these things that he's saying here. This, this isn't the most profound uh, piece of, of Paul's teaching in the New Testament. Uh, I, I would say this is obvious to all of us. Bosses love it when their staff do what they're employed to do and what they're told to do and when they do it without back chat. A boss loves it when their, their staff don't steal out of the stationery cabinet or from the hours that they're paid to work. If we wrote a list of values that Christians should bring to their workplace, all, all this stuff would be on it. Uh, and probably some other stuff too. So as I say, in a sense, there's nothing very deeply profound in what Paul is urging Titus to teach the Christians about their workplaces. I'd like to take a little bit longer with Paul's fifth idea because I think it, it probably serves well as a summary of all the ideas. Christian slaves or employees ought to show that they can be fully trusted. That's it, isn't it? If you're an employer here today, if, if anybody works for you, you'll recognize this as the thing that you would most want in your team, in your employees. People you can trust. People who will care for clients, who will create profit, who will deliver effectiveness in your organization without having to be watched at every turn, without having to be cajoled to do a day's work, without having to be micromanaged. When Christians show that they can be fully trusted like that, they, they please their bosses, they inspire their colleagues, and they, they witness power, powerfully for Jesus in their workplace. Sometimes it helps to have pictures of this in your mind. Well, what does that look like? The Bible gives us some wonderful pictures of, of brilliant employees or brilliant people who work under the authority of others. Do, do you remember what Pharaoh said to Joseph or about Joseph when he got the first glimpse of, of what Joseph could be in the Egyptian court? He turned to his officials gathered around him and he said, can we find anyone like this man on whom is the spirit of God? That's, that's amazing. So you have pagan Pharaoh who doesn't know much, we don't think, about the living God. But as soon as he sees him in a person, he recognizes it. There's no one like Joseph. Look at that, he's got the spirit of God on him. Or, or think of Daniel. He's the young Jewish exile brought into the court of another church or another world superpower, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. Do you remember what Nebuchadnezzar said about him when he began to, to see the effect that Daniel could have in his court? You have this pagan king saying, surely your God is the God of all gods and the Lord of all kings. The narrator tells us that Nebuchadnezzar took Daniel and made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Folks, whenever I read uh, Titus 2, 9 and 10, when I re reflect on, on passages like this one with, with Joseph or, or with Daniel, it stirs a dream in me. I, I dream of a day when the, the local employment agencies or, or the headhunters have me on speed dial and they call me quite regularly. Christoph, ha, have you got someone? I've got an employer. They're looking for a person to work in this particular role. They told me they already have a couple of Hamilton Road people and they're brilliant. 
and they want to see if they could get some more. They want more people where those folks came from. Folks, that's what Paul's talking about. This is what it looks like when Christian people live godly lives in their workplaces. We've thought about what it looks like. That brings us to our second question. How is it possible? How can we be good in work? Actually, it's a question we've had hanging over us right through this series because we, we said early on in this series that, that Paul would be encouraging Titus to, to teach the people how to live good lives, but we haven't, we haven't addressed the how question. How is this going to be possible? We've said that we want a church that makes the gospel beautiful. We want, we want people who are good in church and now good in their workplace. But how? You see, there's a problem. We're not good. Any one of us who tries to, to be a good and godly person in the church family or, or in our workplace or our neighborhood, we soon discover that we're not able for it. We're not good. And that's why we don't attract people to our churches, at least not in, in vast quantities uh, and, and not very often. We're called to be good, but we're not able to do it. How is this going to be possible? Well, if you've been around Hamilton Road any length of time, the answer we'll find in this passage won't surprise you. If we're going to be good, if this is going to be possible, then it must all be of grace, all of God's grace. Paul tells us in this short passage about two, I'm going to call them movements of God's grace. Let's take a few moments to see what he says. First, he says, grace offers salvation. Look at verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. What's he talking about when he says the grace of God has appeared? Well, let's not put words in his mouth. Let's, let's let him tell us what he has in mind. Verses 13 to 14. He points us to our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The appearance of God's grace that Paul is talking about is the coming of Jesus. And he then goes on to talk more particularly about how God's grace has come in Jesus. He says he gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness. What do you know about the moment when God, Jesus, gave himself for us? That's the moment, isn't it? When he went to the cross in our stead, in our place. And what did he achieve for us there? Well, Paul says he redeemed us from all wickedness. This is the most beautiful news in the world. And this is why we call it the gospel, the good news. It's the news that, that though I was a prisoner in my sin, and though I stood under a death penalty, Jesus Christ came and redeemed me, bought me back, set me free and gave me new life. Folks, the truth is, no matter how much my sin has offended the holiness of God, in Jesus, God forgives me. No matter how much I've messed up my life, in Jesus, God gives me new life. And it's all a gift. It's all of grace. Isn't it just the best news? Folks, I, I wonder, uh, I, I just have to pause here and, and ask you, have you accepted God's gracious offer of salvation in Jesus Christ? If you haven't, I want you to stop. 
I give you permission not to listen to the rest of what I share this morning. I can't take you anywhere if you haven't accepted Jesus. If you haven't accepted God's gracious offer of salvation in Jesus. Please be sure that you do. If, if you need somebody to help you with that, talk to a, a friend who's already a Christian. Ask them, how, how, do I, how do I get in? How do I start life with Jesus? If you don't have somebody like that you could talk to, I'd love it if you contacted me. There's nothing I'd rather do than talk to you about how to, how to start in your journey with Jesus. Folks, there are two movements, I've said, of grace in this passage. We've thought about the first one. Paul's talking about God's offer of salvation in Jesus. But the good news gets even better. I, I love this. There's a second movement of God's grace, and you may be less familiar with this. Paul says, verse 12, that the same grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. This is the second movement. God's grace teaches us to live differently. If the first movement of grace is for our salvation, then the second is an ongoing work for our transformation. It's all God's grace. It's a wonderful truth. One way I like to put it when I'm sharing this with people, God's grace means that he takes us as he finds us. Nobody is too sinful, too far from God. God's grace takes us as he finds us. But here's the thing. God in his grace never leaves us where he finds us. He wants to make us into something entirely different, beautiful, and new. Did you know that? That all of this is God's grace? Sometimes we live as if we've forgotten that. We, we know that God's grace is there at the start of our journey, that it's there, that it's only by grace that we're saved. But then once, once we're in, once we're a Christian, we start to live by our own efforts again. We imagine that we can try hard to be a good Christian. In the context of today's passage, we might say, right, I know I'm supposed to be good at work. I'll, I'll try, tomorrow's Monday, I'll try hard to be good in work. No, Paul says. That's not how it works. You're not done with God's grace when you begin your journey with Jesus. All you've done in that moment is begun to interact with the grace that God wants to give you for the rest of your life. God's grace now becomes our teacher. God's grace works for our transformation. Maybe what I've shared with you in those last moments about this second movement of God's grace is a surprise to you. One way you could test it, and I'd encourage you to do this if you want to test it, Go on to a Bible software and, and do a word search of the word grace as it appears in the New Testament. What you'll discover is that there are loads of mentions of grace, loads of mentions that have to do with that first movement, God graciously reaching sinful people and bringing them into a saving relationship through Jesus. There are lots of references to that. What you'll discover as well is that there are even more references to the ongoing work of God's grace in our lives day by day. This teaching, transforming work of grace. I once heard Dallas Willard teaching on this subject, and he gave me an image that I'll never forget. He was making this point that, that Christians don't just start in God's grace, they live dependent on God's grace every single moment of every day. We're not just saved by grace, we live by grace. And as he summed up his teaching, he said this. He said, if I'm living by grace, 
If I'm like an engine that's burning petrol or diesel, you know, burning grace, then he says, I'd rather be a jumbo jet than a lawnmower. I love that. I want to be doing like 0.5 miles to the gallon. I, I want to be guzzling God's grace. I want to live a life that I, I need it. I want to be asking more of myself, attempting more for the kingdom of God so that I'm living a life that I couldn't live without him. Friends, we are saved by grace and grace teaches us and transforms us. We're talking this morning about being good at work. We've talked about what it looks like, how it might be possible. Finally, for a few moments, what might actually happen if I and you and we together were able to, to live these grace-filled, spirit-filled lives? Well, according to Paul, chapter, ten, or chapter 2, verse 10, the second part of that verse, the most wonderful thing will happen. The gospel will finally be seen to be beautiful. You know your colleagues in work and your neighbors, the people who don't see it? They, they can see it. Paul says, they can see that the message about Jesus is beautiful. When Claire and I were engaged in the summer of 1998, we, we knew that we were going to spend the duration of our engagement apart. Um, she was living here in Bangor at the time, and I was living in Vancouver on the west coast of Canada, 5,000 miles apart for six months. We thought, well, that's just too long, so we, we need to get together at some point during those five months or six months. So we talked a little bit about it, you know, should there's a reading week in college, shall I fly home for a week and we catch up that way? Or should Claire take a week's leave and come to be in Vancouver? And then we thought about it some more and, and we realized, well, we, we could do something more interesting. Why don't we meet up halfway? So we, we spent five wonderful days in, in New York City enjoying the, the sights there, enjoying the city together. So we went to, to see the tourist sites, Empire State Building, Central Park, Statue of Liberty, all those kinds of things. I can remember one afternoon, we took a bit of time uh, to walk on the, uh, the Fifth Avenue and Madison Avenue. And if you've ever been in New York or, or maybe even just know about these things, you'll know that they're, they're home to some of the most exclusive shopping in the world. What we were doing there, I don't know. We hadn't two pennies to rub together, but we just went for a, a nosy. What I discovered that afternoon is what a, a stunning thing a, a great window display in a shop can be. A good window display, I think, does a couple of things. First of all, it, it grabs your attention. So, so you, you maybe have had this experience. You're walking down the street. You're not actually going out shopping. You're, you're just on your way down the street. But somehow in your peripheral vision, something catches your eye and draws your attention. That's what a good window display does. That's the first thing it does. But the second thing that, that some of the, the best ones do is that they focus your gaze they're, they're not just a hodgepodge of lots of different things. They, they draw your attention to, to the centerpiece, the thing that's right at the, the heart of it all. Maybe it's a, a piece of expensive jewelry or whatever. Folks, our lives are a shop window. In this frantic, hectic world, our lives are the the place where our, our colleagues and our neighbors get to see the most important thing in the world. Our lives are to capture the
the attention of passers-by. Our, our lives are to focus their gaze on the, the one thing that matters most of all, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look again at the second half of verse 10. The, these employees, these slaves in their workplaces, they're to live with such integrity that they make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. The idea here underlying the, the Greek, well, the Greek word is cosmeo, uh, this idea of making something attractive. And as soon as I say that, you, you know, even in the English, what we're talking about, our word cosmetic. Cosmetics are, made, are used to make things beautiful, to make them attractive. In the New Testament, it was used in a slightly different way. It was used to talk about how you would arrange jewels to make them to, to make their beauty visible to those who are looking at them. Friends, your life and mine, they're the window where the jewel of the gospel is on display for a watching world. Our, our shared lives together, they're, they're like a shop window for the gospel. Our lives are the primary context in which people who aren't yet believers evaluate whether Jesus is beautiful or not. It could be that we're, we're living a life that gives no evidence of our salvation. It's, it's like a, a window display where the lighting's terrible, the window hasn't been cleaned for years. In that case, the gospel jewel, it, it's still there, but it, nobody would see it. And if they do, it's certainly not attractive. But maybe, just maybe our lives are, are beginning to be retrained by the grace of God. The Holy Spirit's at work in us and, and the window is clean, the lighting's good, the presentation is beautiful, and the gospel, the good news about Jesus, shimmers and shines like a diamond under lights. Folks, that's what might happen. That's what might happen. Praise God, it already is happening. We want to see it happening more and more and more. I'm almost out of time. I thought I'd finish by telling you a story of a, a lovely experience I had a few years ago uh, in a most unlikely place. Uh, I got one of those red cards through the letterbox. You know when the postman's been to deliver a parcel and you weren't at home? I don't know about you, I, it's not a good moment for me when I stoop down to pick that up. I, I tend to get a bit grumpy about it. Uh, anyway, I got my card, I set off the next day um, for the, the post office depot in East Belfast where I'm still living. Um, it would be at the top of the Castlereagh Road, if you know where the Castlereagh Road crosses the, the dual carriageway, it's, it's round about that area. So it takes me seven or eight minutes from my house to drive around there. And, you know, by the time I get there, I'm always as grumpy as. And there's a reason for that. It's because I tend to, I tend to rehearse the same rant every time when I go around. Um, I'm going, you know, this is such a waste of my time. You know, why can't they just leave it behind the hedge or leave it with a neighbor? Why can't they find a system that actually works? Why am I driving around here? You know, this kind of thing. I hope, I hope none of you have ever had those thoughts on your way to the post office. I went that day with my card, handed it in to the guy and stood waiting. And he came back with my parcel and he handed it over to me and he said, how's it going at the church? And I was like, nightmare. Here I am, off duty, I'm out of the parish, 
you know, when I'm on the Newton Ards Road, I have to be a, a smiley, affable minister, but I'm on the Castle Ray Road. I can be whoever I like over here. And the guy knows I'm from the church. It was like being done for speeding with a fish sticker on the back of your car, you know, that kind of... I, I thought, I had a look at the guy and thought, I, I don't recognize this guy. And, and I glanced at the parcel. It was just an ordinary Amazon parcel, Mr. C. Ebbinghouse. There was no, no clue. It wasn't, you know, a clerical collar I was having delivered or, you know, it, it, how to be the best minister booklet or, you know, it was just an ordinary. So I, I said to him, how did you know? How did you know I'm from the church? And he said, I, I, know, I know some people from your church. I've got to know them. I've met them on my rounds. People of all ages. I know that a lot of people are being drawn to Jesus Christ there. I was, I was speechless and I, I simply said, Thank you. Thanks for your encouragement. And as I turned to leave, he, he just looked me in the eye and he said, you know, it's, it's a lovely thing when the fragrance starts to go out into the neighborhood. And so it is. Wouldn't it be lovely if I had the same experience soon in Bangor post office. I'll try to be less grumpy. I'll have to be. I've told you all about that. But wouldn't it be lovely that if it ever came up in conversation that you were a member of Hamilton Road Presbyterian Church, the person you're talking to lights up and says, yeah, I've heard about that place. I've seen the kind of people that come out of that place. Tell me more about Jesus. Friends, let's continue to throw ourselves on the grace of God for our salvation. Let's continue to burn more and more and more of God as as he's transforming us, as he's teaching us and transforming us. Let's invite God to turn Hamilton Road into a missional magnet, a place that just draws people to Jesus. And let's, let's ask God to help us live good lives at work so that we can make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. Amen. In just a moment, Leslie's going to come back and lead us and we'll pray to respond to what we've heard in God's word and also uh, for, for some other people. I just want to take a moment to make a few announcements. Uh, this evening we're back together at 6.30. Uh, we're continuing our series of studies in 1 Samuel on the life of David. I'm going to have a go at four chapters this evening, so I'm warning you of that. But what you could do if you get a few minutes this afternoon is, is read them. So it's chapters 26 to 29 of 1 Samuel, if you want to try. I hope I'll be able to guide you through them, even if you haven't read them, but, but do, do consider that. There's still space to sign up for this evening if, if you haven't already done so. This morning, it's been just wonderful. We, we think we've had around about 400, 400 people at our two services today. That's, that's the biggest number of people we've had at church since all of this began. So that's just wonderful. Uh, we're, we're grateful to those who've worked hard to help us facilitate this. With there being more capacity, we, we really want to encourage you to get back into the habit of coming every week. There's no there's no rota anymore, nothing like that. Just sign up uh, when you can. We, we'll open up the sign-ups for all of our services on Sunday evenings at 9 o'clock. So just go on there, uh, sign up, and we'd love to see you. 
All of our other notices are on church suite, but a couple of things to draw to your attention. Uh, one, that there's child protection refresher training happening this week at uh, 7.30 on Thursday evening. It's happening by Zoom, but you, you do need to sign up for that. Also, to give you advance notice, in a couple of weeks' time, we're going to have a communion service on Sunday evening, so Sunday the 20th of June at 6.30. Please be aware of that. Uh, and then, a little bit further down the line, some advanced notice of the Bangor Worldwide. Uh, as you may know, it's a, a week at the end of August where we get a chance to hear about, pray for, and support uh, world mission. Uh, so there are brochures about the, the Bangor Worldwide out there in the vestibule for you to pick up. We have a couple of appeals that we're just launching at the moment. Um, we, we don't prefer to give you two appeals at, at almost the same time, but sometimes appeals come along that we can't quite uh, control the timing of. And if we want to, to respond to help people in need, we, we just accept the timing. Uh, the first of those appeals that you'll read about in the notices, the Delhi Bible Institute have asked whether we can help them with uh, some pandemic relief work that they're doing just at the moment. You know the situation in India has been terrible. Uh, so read, read about that and see if God might be prompting you to give to that appeal. The other appeal is one that we have more regularly uh, at this time of the year, and that's the, the Presbyterian Children's Society. It, it works uh, among vulnerable children here in Ireland. So there'll be an opportunity to give to that, uh, particularly next Sunday, but also in an ongoing way. Thank you uh, for hearing these announcements. And we're going to come before God now with our prayers of response and intercession. And we're going to think today particularly about the Eastwood family, David, Lucy and Naomi in Taiwan. So let's pray. Our Father God, we're so thankful for these passages in your word which teach us how to live godly lives and which remind us that you don't leave us to do this by ourselves, but that you outpour your grace on us to train us how to live lives that will reflect your glory. Father, for those of us that you have placed in workplaces, in offices and schools, or shops, restaurants, in government and hospitals, for those working in the community, for those working with the young or the old, or wherever you have put us, Lord, give us your grace to shine brightly in that space for you. We pray for the leaders in our community um, at this time of change for wisdom and discernment and for a spirit of cooperation and collaboration. Lord, for those Christians in government, we seek your protection, your strength, and your grace, that they will act according to the purpose you have placed them there. For those in our church family who need your strength and love at this time, Lord, encircle them, pour out your love upon them. We pray today for David and Lucy Eastwood and their daughter Naomi. We thank you for the work that you have placed them there to do. We pray for your grace to guide and strengthen them in their work. We know this has been a really busy time for them and for the wider OMF team as the pandemic's infected how the team can work and has meant that some of the team have been unable to leave to go on home assignment and some have been unable to return. Lord, we ask you to work in these situations to calm fears and frustrations, to provide peace and rest. We pray for Taiwan as it's experience in a rise in COVID cases. We ask you to keep David and Lucy and Naomi safe and well. Encircle this family, Lord, and protect them. Give them strength and endurance to continue their work. And we ask this all in your son's name. Amen. We're going to finish off our service this morning by singing What Grace is Mine. Again, this just reflects uh, what Christoph was preaching about, how it's not... Uh, through anything that we can do but through the grace that God gives us that we can reflect God's glory so let's stand and sing
So we're going to end today's service where we started it in Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. So now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of God, so the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the love of God be with us all evermore. Amen.